Welcome back. We've covered Afghan cultivars, African cultivars, and hybrids that blurred into each other. Now, to understand what a true sativa means, we need to look east, to a region where cannabis wasn't bred for hashish or, or short seasons, but for long equatorial sunshine. This is the story of the Thai landrosses, tall, narrow-leafed cultivars that became the genetic blueprint for what the West came to call sativa. Here's the first thing to understand. Thai landrosi is the most common umbrella term today, but in reality there was never one standardized Thai. Instead, Thailand historically had regional cultivars tied to geography. The northern provinces like Chiang Mai and Chiang Rai grew spicier, earthier plants in their mountain terrain. Northeastern regions near the Lao border produced phenotypes with sharper citrus and pepper notes. Southern coastal cultivars leaned fruitier, adapted to tropical humidity. Each of these plants was a land race in its own right, shaped by microclimate, tradition, and farmer selection. Western breeders in the 1970s and 80s didn't see that nuance. They lumped them all together as Thai, a convenient shorthand for tall, long-flowering cannabis from Southeast Asia. The result is that an incredibly diverse set of local cultivars was collapsed into one word. What survived in Western memory was not the regional detail, but the export form that defined the era, Thai stick. Thai stick wasn't a strain. It was a preparation. Buds were carefully bound to sticks with hemp fiber, sometimes coated in resin or hash oil, and cured into tightly packed wands of cannabis. Smuggled out of Thailand in the 60s and 70s, these sticks flooded the US and Europe, earning a reputation for potency, exotic aroma, and a clean soaring high that lasted for hours. For many Western consumers of the era, Thai stick was their first introduction to sativa, even though in its homeland, it was just one way among many that cannabis was prepared and shared. Culturally, cannabis in Thailand was tied to medicine, ceremony, and everyday life. Known locally as ganja, a word inherited from Sanskrit, it was used as a poultice for wounds, as a digestive aid in food, and as a ritual herb in spiritual practice. Farmers cultivated it, not just for export, but for community. And while alcohol was widespread, cannabis held its own as a crop of resilience, adapted to long flowering cycles of 14 to 16 weeks, producing airy buds with resin geared more for effect than for pressing. What defined the Thai land races was not resin for hash, like in Afghanistan, but structure and longevity. These were towering plants, sometimes over 12 feet tall, bred to soak up equatorial sunlight. Their morphology, tall stature, narrow leaves, extended flowering times, became the visual and chemical baseline of what Western breeders labeled sativa. The tragedy is that in the process of export, the story was simplified. Thai became shorthand, Thai stick became the international brand, and the rich diversity of regional cultivars was lost in translation. But if we are to understand what a true sativa means, we must return to this origin point. Cannabis adapted to the tropics, stabilized by Thai farmers, and immortalized, however imperfectly, in the word Thai. If the cultural roots of Thai landrasses show us where these plants came from, their chemistry reveals why they came to define the word sativa. Unlike Afghan indicas bred for short seasons and resin pressing, Thai cultivars were stabilized in an equatorial environment with endless sun, high humidity, and long growing cycles. Plants here had the luxury of time, flowering for 14 to 16 weeks or longer, which gave them space to evolve a chemistry distinct from anything grown in arid mountain climates. Cannabinoid analysis of authentic Thai land races shows them to be THC dominant, often reaching into the 16% to 20% range in flower with very little CBD. That number might sound average by modern standards, but remember, THC percentages aren't the whole story. What makes Thai unique is its terpene profile and the way those molecules shape THC's effects in the body and mind. The dominant driver here is terpinaline, often present at levels above 0.5%, and sometimes pushing close to 1.0%. 
Terpinoline is a terpene rarely dominant in most modern cultivars, which is one reason Thai stood out. It carries aromas of pine, citrus, and fresh herbs, and more importantly, it steers THC toward a bright, cerebral experience. Where myrcene tends to deepen and anchor THC's effects, terpinoline does the opposite. It stretches them upward, producing a feeling of mental clarity, creativity, and clean energy. Supporting terpinoline is oxymene, another terpene that thrives in equatorial plants. Oxymene delivers sweet, floral, and sometimes slightly tropical notes, adding to its head-high reputation. In combination with terpinoline, it contributes to a sharp onset and sustained clarity, the kind of high people describe as soaring or daytime functional. Limonene is present in significant amounts, lending a citrus brightness that prevents the experience from feeling flat. Pinin, both alpha and beta pinin, is a consistent supporting terpene, offering that crisp pine aroma while contributing to alertness. Research has suggested Pinan's ability to counter some of THC's memory impairment, which may help explain why Thai land races were remembered not as foggy, but as clear extended highs. Together, this terpene matrix creates what consumers came to call the true sativa effect. High THC provides intensity, but terpinoline, osamine, lemonine, and pinene direct it toward focus, creativity, and clarity instead of sedation. The result isn't a jittery rush, it's long-lasting cerebral stimulation that can extend for hours, a reflection of the plant's own long flowering cycles. In fact, the very structure of the plant mirrors its chemistry. Tall, narrow leaves stretching toward the sun, flowering endlessly, delivering highs that felt unbounded compared to short, resin-heavy indicas. From a bud tender's perspective, Thai land races are the textbook example of why terpene literacy matters. Labeling them simply as sativa equal sign energizing erases the truth. It isn't just the morphology that makes Thai a sativa, it's the chemistry, terpinoline steering THC, otimeni amplifying brightness, pinene sharpening clarity. That's why consumers in the 60s and 70s remembered Thai stick as something entirely different from what they found in Afghan hash. In other words, Thai land races didn't just create a category. They created a chemical language of sativa, one that modern hybrids imitate but rarely replicate. To understand Thai land races, you have to look beyond the lab numbers and into the lived experience. Smoking Thai wasn't like smoking Afghan. It wasn't heavy, it wasn't grounding, and it certainly wasn't short-lived. The high was long, sometimes stretching five or six hours, with a clarity that stood out in contrast to the body-centered stillness of hashish. Consumers in Thailand described it as expansive, something that opened the mind, lifted the senses, and allowed work, music, or meditation to continue without collapse. In the 1960s and 70s, when Thai stick began flooding Western markets, this quality made it legendary. It wasn't just strong, it was different. But difference has a way of getting simplified when it crosses cultures. In Thailand, cannabis wasn't divided into categories of up and down. It was ganja, a crop that could be woven into food, medicine, ritual, or recreation, its qualities appreciated in context. In the West, however, consumers and dispensers needed easy language. Afghan seeds had already been labeled indica, shorthand for heavy and sedating. Thai became its opposite, sativa, shorthand for light, cerebral, and energizing. Overnight, an incredibly diverse set of land races, northern, southern, northeastern, each with their own nuances, was collapsed into a single stereotype, daytime weed. The psychology of this mischaracterization is important. Once the binary was established, expectation did the rest. Western consumers lighting up tie sticks approached them as the daytime high, so that's how the experience was framed. Yes, the terpinoline-driven chemistry genuinely produced focus and mental stimulation, but the framing exaggerated it, reinforcing the idea that all sativas were interchangeable, energetic, creative, and social. What was lost in translation were the subtleties, 
that high doses of Thai could become racy, even anxious for some, that certain phenotypes carried a spicier, grounding undertone, that flowering times and climate shaped each region's plant into a slightly different expression. Bud tenders today still inherit that oversimplification. Compliance safe descriptors like energizing or daytime dominate menus, reducing Thai land races and the countless hybrids descended from them into caricatures. This isn't just inaccurate, it's a disservice to consumers. Someone looking for focus may indeed find it in a Thai leaning profile, but someone sensitive to terpinaline might end up overwhelmed. The sativa equals energizing script erases both the nuance of the chemistry and the diversity of consumer response. And yet, the stereotype endures because it's easy. Indica down, sativa up. Thai became the poster child for this simplicity. But as with Afghan indicas, the truth is richer. Thai wasn't created to be daytime cannabis. It was created by environment and culture. Tall plants thriving under equatorial sun, flowering endlessly, producing chemistry that happened to interact with THC in ways that felt clear and extended. To reduce that to a binary label is to strip away both history and reality. The experience of Thai land races shows us that sativa is not a promise of energy, but a spectrum of effects driven by terpinaline, alkamini, limonene, and pinene. The West turned that spectrum into a single word, and in doing so, reshaped consumer expectation for decades. The story of Thai land races proves something that every consumer, grower, and bud tender needs to understand. The sativa label is just as broken as the indica label. For decades, dispensary menus in consumer culture have relied on the shorthand of up versus down, daytime versus nighttime. But the truth is far more complex. Thai cultivars didn't define sativa because they were universally energizing. They defined it because they carried a unique chemistry, THC guided by terpinaline, osamine, limonene, and pinene, that produced long, clear, cerebral highs, unlike the heavy, resinous effects of Afghan cultivars. That chemistry is real. The label that grew out of it is the, the distortion. When Western breeders lumped every regional phenotype of Thailand into the single word Thai, and then made it the mascot of sativa, they erased both cultural nuance and chemical diversity. And once consumers were told that sativa equals focus and energy, expectation took over. The placebo effect, reinforced by compliance-friendly bud tender scripts, hardened stereotype into doctrine. The result is a market where consumers often buy a label, not a profile, and where bud tenders are forced to rely on categories that hide more than they reveal. The way forward isn't to abandon cannabis education, it's to refine it. Instead of binaries, we need profiles, menus that show the top terpenes alongside cannabinoid ranges, conversations where a bud tender can say, this cultivar is terpinaline dominant with many support, so expect a clear, long-lasting cerebral experience. That kind of language respects both compliance rules and consumer intelligence. It, it doesn't promise medical outcomes. It doesn't flatten complexity into stereotypes. It tells the truth about the chemistry. For consumers, this knowledge is empowerment. When you learn that Thai land races weren't a monolith, but a collection of cultivars shaped by climate and tradition, you stop expecting sativa to mean a guaranteed burst of energy. Instead, you start looking for terpinaline, for pinene, for the actual drivers of the effect you want. And in that shift, the myth loses power. Thailand races gave the world a glimpse of what cannabis could be under equatorial sun, towering plants, flowering endlessly, producing highs that stretched into clarity. But they also gave us a cautionary tale, how easily complexity can be erased by oversimplification. If we want a cannabis culture that is informed, sustainable, and respectful of history, we have to move past the binary. The future belongs to terpene literacy, not to marketing shorthand. So, the next time you see sativa on a menu, remember, it isn't the label that defines the experience, it's the chemistry. And it was Thai land dresses that taught us this lesson first. 
subscribe, and share to keep cannabis knowledge free, accurate, and empowering. This content is for educational purposes only. It is not medical advice, and no claims are being made regarding treatment, diagnosis, or cure. Always follow your local laws and regulations when purchasing, possessing, or consuming cannabis. The truth is more complex, and that is why terpene literacy is the future of cannabis education.